Peter Ludlow is associate researcher at the Center for Logic and Epistemology at Unicamp. He has taught philosophy at several universities, including University of Michigan and Northwestern. Uh, his books have largely been about philosophy and linguistics. Um, hi, Peter. Hey there. How are you doing? Great. Thanks for being here. Sure. Uh, you have done work in generative grammar and linguistics. Um, how did you get introduced to the ideas of Noam Chomsky? I mean, I'd heard about it when I was an undergraduate, and I thought it sounded pretty interesting. And then when I came to graduate school at Columbia University, I had a couple of professors that were really into Chomsky and linguistics. Um, at the time... Columbia was still under the influence of these American pragmatists like John Dewey. And they had um, this view that science and philosophy are continuous. And so a lot of doing philosophy involves getting down with the natural sciences. And uh, therefore, if you were gonna do philosophy of language, you should know something about linguistics. And a couple of my professors, like two or three of them, were actually uh, philosophers, but they were also very good linguists in addition to that. And so a philosophy of language class with them ended up being a philosophy of linguistics class and a straight up linguistics class. And uh, I became interested in linguistics because of that. And then I applied to go to uh, MIT for a year to just uh, be like a, a I guess the the official title was uh, something like visiting scholar, I guess. And um, so I went there and just spent a year studying linguistics at MIT. And since you were at MIT, did you ever meet uh, Chomsky or take a class by him? Uh, both, yeah. I, I took uh, several of his classes and then I met him a few times. And uh, all of What's the, that uh, like? What was the pro that process of meeting him like? I, doesn't he have? I I thought he said something um that he has like security that like he didn't want security, but the school like insisted that he had security. Um, in those days there was no security. I don't I don't know what the situation is now, but at the time the linguistics department was in this this old old building called Building Twenty that had been built during World War II as a temporary headquarters for. Um, doing research on radar and so forth. And then at some point, linguistics moved into that building, but it was also historically an extremely important building at MIT. I mean, it was just so, it was just like a ratchety old building that, uh, you know, whenever they needed to take out a wall, someone would just take a chainsaw to it and take out the wall. And there were all kinds of really important laboratories in there. Um, uh, and, Perhaps most importantly of all, the MIT Model Train Club was in there, which ended up being kind of the, the ground zero for the birth of hacktivism in the United States, or the, or the birth of hacking, actually, because uh, these guys in the Model Train Club had an early uh, like PDP computer, and they used it to sort of program their trains buzzing around in the place. I mean, it was an amazing place. It was an amazing building. Uh, lots of amazing people were in there. And on top of it all, Chomsky was in there. Uh, and uh, there was no security at the time, if, but it was, a, it was a thing to get in to meet him. And it's like getting in to meet a, a dentist or something. You know, you make an appointment, you schedule an appointment, you go in, you hang out in the outer office, and then you go in and like, then you talk to him. Yeah. Any, uh, any stories about that? First time meeting him or any, you know, sure. feedback well, he the gave first, you? Yeah, the first, <laughs> the first time I met him, it went something like this. I, I, I went in and go, I am, my name is Peter Ludlow. I'm visiting from uh, Columbia University. He goes, yeah, yeah, I know that. <laughs> I go, well, uh, I'm working on my dissertation. He goes, what's it on? And I said, well, it's on like, you know, X, Y, and Z. And he goes, oh, that, that's not going to work. I go, okay, why, oh, why is that not going to work? Because he gives me these reasons, X, Y, and Z, you know, on and on. But then I found out that he just, this is just his thing. Like, he views his role as to be a intellectual foil to you. So the next time I met with him, I went in and I go, uh, he goes, hey, how's it going? I go, oh, not very good. 
He goes, what's the problem? I go, well, I have these problems with my dissertation. He goes, oh yeah, what are the problems? I go, oh, X, Y, and Z. He goes, oh, those aren't problems. <laughs> so oh. you have to, yeah. So you can like, if you have a problem, so it doesn't matter what you sort of present to him. He's going to be there as, as the intellectual foil for you, right? So if you come to him with some sort of insolvable problem, then, you know, you can sort of, you can trick him into solving it for you if you want. Interesting. Sometimes. Yeah. Interesting. Did, uh, I think I heard you say something like you, you were working on your doctoral thesis and um, you obviously you had your, your, advise, your graduate advisor and didn't Chomsky end up going through your, um, your uh, thesis and giving you more detailed and thorough and helpful notes than your own graduate advisor gave it? Yeah, definitely. You could, um, you would definitely get more feedback from Chomsky than from official advisors and so forth but i'm sure that's an experience that many people had i'm not that's not just my experience i mean i don't, my advisor was a very good advisor but i think chomsky was just a, a tremendous resource to hundreds if not thousands of people yeah i mean chomsky i, I think he edited a couple of my papers in, high school, in uh, college and, and after uh, uh oh you sent him papers and he yeah, gave you feedback said, on them yeah. oh yeah he gave me great feedback yeah, 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 yeah. No, you can get great feedback from him, no doubt. Um, what is the problem of meaning? So there's a couple of questions here. One is whether people do determine what the meaning of an expression is or whether the expression just has a meaning, right? Or maybe it's a community that determines the meaning. So what is the meaning of an expression like water or cookie or, or brisket, to use an example from Tyler Burge, right? Well, I mean, there's a bunch of different theories about that. One theory, and this is the, this is like the Humpty Dumpty theory from Lewis Carroll, like Humpty Dumpty thought that words meant whatever he wanted them to mean, right? So that's one possibility. Maybe when I use a word like brisket or water, it's just that word means what I want it to mean. Alternatively, it could be that my community determines what it means so that it's not my decision, but it's the decision of everyone around us. Uh, I happen to believe that when we sit down and have a conversation, we're building little micro languages together so that you and I and our, our audience here we're gonna work out the meanings of these expressions together so that we negotiate the meanings of these terms. So my view would be that we determine the meaning when we sit down and have a conversation together. Putnam famously argued that meanings ate in the head. Chomsky said, if by meanings we have in mind what people have in mind when they're using the word in English, then meanings are not in the head. For example, he said, the meaning of life is not in the head. What's he mean there? I don't know what he means there, but it, that's a, a he said it to you. Weird... <laughs> <laughs> he said it to me. He said it to you in your interview. This was in your interview with him a long oh. time ago. Yeah. Well, to this day, I don't, I don't know what he, what he meant by that because when you start talking about meaning of life, you're, you're using meaning in a different way, right? So when you talk about the meaning of life, that's like, what is the purpose of life? Yes. Right. What should I be doing? What, or what should my intention be? Um, that's a possibility. Yes. Right. I mean, yeah. it, I mean, it might be, what should I be doing or what, what could give my life more meaning, yes. you know? I mean, so there's a lot of things. It's, it, so that's the sort of thing they're asking. But when people say, oh, when Hillary Putnam says meanings aren't in the head, he's talking about the meanings of words like water, you know? And that's, that's, I think that's a different story. I mean, I think English really is ambiguous in a serious way about this. There's a kind of notion of meaning, like, you know, what's it all about? <laughs> you know? And then there's the other one was, what does that word mean? When Putnam says they ain't in the head, I take it to mean it's not like up to you to decide what water means. It's outside of your head. It exists outside. It's mind independent. It's definitely mind independent on his. That's view. what that yeah. means. That's to right. Just, just uh, for the record, I had mentioned Chomsky talking about uh, the meaning of life. 
Um, I it just reminded me I, I had uh, heard him talk about what his answer uh, to that question. Um, his yeah, answer. What's, what's his answer? Uh, his answer was the meaning of your life um, is determined by what you have done with your life. So if you spend your time playing chess, Chomsky would say that is the meaning of your life. Well, I, that's an answer. What do you think of that answer? I think it's interesting. Um, it's, it kind of takes away the problem. So when, so when people say, well, what's the meaning of, of life? What they're, what they're trying to ask is something, this is why I brought up should, what should I be doing? They're trying to ask something like, I might be doing things wrong. So can you, I wonder what the right thing to do is, or I wonder what the thing that's going to make me happier is. And so they're like kind of, you're searching for something to like a change. And what Chomsky's saying is all you have to do is look at what you care about and what you're doing. And that will just tell you what meaning is for you. And so it kind of yeah. takes away, it kind of takes away the whole problem. Yeah, but isn't that just nuttery, though? I mean, suppose you asked him, well, okay, Noam, so, like, there's this business person on Wall Street who thinks the meaning of life is making lots and lots of money uh, so that he can buy or she can buy Lamborghinis and, and Rolex watches and so forth. I mean, is he going to say that that, per that person successfully figured out the meaning of life? I mean, I wouldn't think so. Right. I mean, you can. So, I mean, I mean, what he's saying is that people do come up with their own goals um, and sure, they do come up with their own goals. But I'm not sure that that gets at what people are talking about when they talk about the meaning of life. Right. So someone at the end of their life, they have all these toys. They have the Lamborghinis. They have the Rolex watches. They have the fine clothes. They have the, the fancy penthouse on Park Avenue or wherever. I mean, did they find the meaning of life? I mean, they might say, dude, I totally blew it, man. I <laughs> well, have all this stuff, but it got nothing to do with the meaning of life. Could be. I mean, it could also be that at the end of their life that the meaning of life for them changed. Yeah, but it's also possible that they reflected and thought, dude, I, I totally screwed it up, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't. So, I mean, normally when people talk about the meaning of life in that sense, um, that is something that is independent of the tasks that they have before them. So they can be completely clear on what is important to them, what their job is, what their tasks and goals are in life. Even if it's something like having a family and raising good kids. And then at the end, they might say, or even along the way, they might say, there's got to be more to it than this. And when, when people ask that question, as they often do, it's because they're thinking there must be something more to life than these goals that they've established for themselves, even if those goals are completely noble. Okay, I want to move on. I wrote to Chomsky uh, many, many, many years ago that I had my first day in philosophy class, and uh, it involved the paradox of existence. We talked about the question um, of whether a car that has each of its parts replaced gradually is still the same car. Um, I told him that it seemed kind of pointless to me and reminded me of something that, that he said in regards to whether or not um, we should say a submarine swims or if London uh, was rebuilt 50 miles away, would it still be London? Like if you picked up London and you moved it like 50 miles away, would we, sure. is that still London? I know that Chomsky's talked about that. Um, I said to him, um, you know, I'm not the same person I was when I was five, considering all of my cells have been replaced since then. Uh, all this just seems like a matter of definition. If you want to call it London, then it's still London. Am I missing something? And here's what Chomsky wrote. Chomsky said, that's the famous ship of Theseus, goes back to Plutarch. It's a paradox if one assumes that words refer to things. The latter being mind-independent entities that a physicist could in principle identify. 
but they don't. In other words, words don't refer to things. That's a philosophical illusion about natural language and its semantics. In the case of natural language, words don't refer. People do. Referring is an action. And the words of language provide complex perspectives for carrying out and interpreting the action. As a disproof of physical as a disproof of philosophical theories about reference, the alleged paradox is interesting. So why don't you um, unpack that a little bit about, um, you know, what I said in, in his, what he was saying in response. He says in there, well, words don't refer, people do. Okay. Um, this is an idea that comes from the philosopher John Austin, a 1950s Oxford philosopher, um, Chomsky will often cite him when he makes this point. Um, and the point is that reference is something that people do, okay? It's not something that a word does because what is a word? It's maybe it's just an ink marking or maybe it's just some sort of representation or maybe it's an abstract object, but you need a person there to carry out the act of reference. That's the idea. But the thing is that certain words are naturally used to refer to certain things. And we have certain conventions about what words are going to be used to refer to what. So for example, uh, we use the term water. Uh, we're not entirely consistent on what it's going to be used to refer to, uh, but you and I know that it's not going to be used to refer to the microphone that's in front of you. So if I say, water is good for you, your audience knows I'm not saying that that microphone is good for you, okay? So what's going on? Yes, I did, I did, you, I did refer to water, but there's certain words that we have conventions that we're going to use to word, refer to certain things with those words. So if I use the term Noam Chomsky, as we've done throughout this thing, we don't have to like go and point to him in real life. Everyone in this podcast knows who we're talking about. But yes, you and I are the ones doing the referring, but, you know, <laughs> but it's with the help of that word. You know, like in Italian, they have this expression, you know, you don't say, what is the meaning of the term? You say, cosa vuol dire? That is, what does it want to say? So you could think of it that way. You know, what does this word want to say? Or what does this word want to be used to refer to? Let's back up just a little bit. So I had talked about the ship of Theseus. And what mm -hmm. that is, is you're imagining the ship where planks are being replaced. And at what, what you ask people is, at what point does it become a new ship if all of it is slowly being replaced? Okay. Mm -hmm. And, you know, somebody says uh, 51, 51% becomes a new ship. It's like, well, that's pretty, you know, arbitrary. Okay. So we have this problem that seems hard to solve, okay? It's, you could call it, I guess, like an identity problem is what makes something what it is, like what makes it the ship of Theseus, okay? Yep. And now, um, so we go back and forth going, ah, oh, when am I a new me? I mean, my cells are replaced, you know what? And Chomsky comes and cuts through this and goes, this is ridiculous. There is no problem. Here's why, Okay. Words don't refer to things. The only reason you think there's a problem of this ship of Theseus or, you know, what, what makes it a new ship or is it still London if we pick it up and move it 50 miles away? The only reason you think that this is a problem to solve is because you are assuming that words refer to things. Yeah, but that's now, just nuttery, bro. That's, but, but, that's but, just hold, nuttery. But hold on, I'm, I'm trying to... It's still a problem, even if there's no external world, right? I that, mean, you that, that's know, fine. Yeah. yeah, that's fine. I'm just, I'm trying to unpack it for people. Just, just yeah, okay. I'm trying to just explain it. Okay. And so, All and right. then Ch and Chomsky comes in and says, uh, it's not a problem because when I refer to a ship, there are no ships, is what Chomsky wants to say. There's no planets. There's no ships. There's no tables. There's a concept in our head called ship. And we... We refer to something. It's an action we do. So you want to call it a ship or you want to call it a paperweight, fine, whatever. And so that's why there is no problem. This is all meaningless. The, the problem doesn't come from having the ship of Theseus be something in the external world. 
but by the way, let's 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 go through that ship of Theseus example in more detail because it's not really a question of like you get to plank number fifty one or whatever, and now you're wondering if it's the same ship. You have this you you have this sort of clear intuition or judgment, whatever you want to call it, that as you keep replacing the planks on the ship, you still have the same ship. Let's say we replace one every month or one every year even. Um, and then like after 100 years or 200 years, you discover that absolutely every plank in the ship has ultimately been replaced, okay? But you're still calling it, you know, the ship of Theseus. Meanwhile, here's where the trickery comes in or here's where the puzzle comes in. Someone has been taking all those planks that were replacing them and storing them in a warehouse. And then like at the end of 200 years, they take all those old planks and put them together and they say, aha, I have the ship of Theseus. And then the question is, and so there's a kind of intuition, oh yeah, that's a pretty good case for the ship of Theseus too. And so you get this kind of puzzle. Now, um, you know, which one is really the ship of Theseus? And, uh, you know, my judgment or my idea would be that, well, it depends on which set of definitions of, of identity that you're going to go with here, right? Um, and so my view is that when we sit down and have a conversation about whether, about the ship of Theseus and whether we're, you know, going to track the identity of the ship of Theseus, we may have to tighten up our definition of identity through time. Because you remember earlier I said, you know, when we sit down and we, we construct our little conversation, construct our micro language, words are, have open textured meaning. And part of that it applies to words like identity too. And, and the concept or the expression uh, identity over time. And, you know, for the most part, it doesn't matter which of those definitions we use, you know, slowly replacing parts or keeping all the original parts. You have, to, it takes, it's only under extreme circumstances that you can get a, a case in which those two different definitions that, so that were get you to different results. And my point is that, you know, okay, well, in that case, you got to sit down and decide which set of definitions or which definition of identity you, you want to roll with for purposes of this micro language that we're building. But that would be true even if there's no external world, right? So even if we're sitting there having this conversation and we say, uh, look, don't worry about what's actually going on. I just want you to focus on the concept, the concept of the ship of Theseus. Forget the external world. There is no external world. Now, we're going to conceptually replace the planks of the ship of Theseus. Concepts of planks, right? And then at the end, we go, well, is it, is it the same ship? Are they different ships? Oh, Are okay. they the same concept or different oh. concepts? Any problem you have when you're talking about, whoa, is it the same ship or a different ship? You've got the same problem when you're asking, is it the same concept or a different concept in your head? So, so you're saying that that Chomsky's way of say of trying to get a rep, not, I mean, his way of let's say getting around it by saying words don't refer to things. It actually doesn't solve the problem it at all. Doesn't solve the problem at all, no. Uh, because you can just imagine, well, forget a ship of Theseus out there where you have words not referring to things. People are referring, just imagine the ship of Theseus Correct. in your head, and now we don't Correct. even have this issue of reference. Correct. Do we have okay. one or two? Are there one or two ships of Theseus in your head? Well, yeah. that depends, right? Very interesting. Okay. So um, I went on to ask Chomsky. Um, I said to him that, that uh, I say, you say the ship of uh, Theseus paradox uh, is meaning, is quote, meaningless. And that's a primary theme in contemporary analytic philosophy. It's just not about anything, close quote. And I asked Chomsky, would you mind elaborating on your quote? And Chomsky said, the background question is whether there is a word-object relation, <clears throat> to borrow Quine's term. Uh, that is, do words refer to mind external things? If they do, then the ship of Theseus poses an irresolvable paradox. Since they don't, as should have been clear since Aristotle, if not Heraclitus, then the debates are meaningless. And by Aristotle and Heraclitus, I think the examples are, I don't want to get into this too much, but Aristotle talked about what a house is. 
and a house is part matter, brick, stone, wood, uh, but a, another part of a house is its form, function, like what form. function? Form. Okay, and and then Heraclitus, Heraclitus talks about like if you step in the same river twice, you know, is it the same? You know, is it Can't the same river? It. Can't, Can't do, do it. it. <laughs> okay, right. Uh, right. So I so I say to uh, so I say to Chomsky, does your reasoning here about the word object relation, which makes the ship of Theseus meaningless, as you say, does that also apply to Putnam's famous proof that we are not brains in vats? Now, before I get to Chomsky's response. Um, I thought this was a really interesting topic. Lots of people are fans of the Matrix, might not even know about this argument that wait, goes back okay, to- Okay, but wait a minute, wait a minute. Before you get to the brain and vat thing, I mean, think about what he just said there and think about what we just said, because he's saying that some, again, he's saying there that, you know, the, the whole ship of Theseus is only a problem if you believe in the external world, but that's not true. It's a problem for people who are straight up idealists too. Even if you don't believe in the external world, the ship of Theseus is still a problem. I, I also don't understand why he's saying it's some sort of problem with analytic philosophy. It's 2000 years older than the birth right. of analytic philosophy. It's not That's like true. it's not like Frege and Bertrand Russell got together and thought up this problem. It's been with us for 2000 years and it's a problem that everyone had to deal with including lots of idealists and people that didn't believe in the external world you know Both, so i yeah. don't i don't you know what what is this idea i mean i don't even think it's necessarily an intractable problem i mean people give answers to this problem i don't you know so so he's saying it's got it's only a problem if you believe in the external world and then it's an intractable problem well that's that's double wrong it's wrong because it's got nothing to do with whether words refer to things in the external world. And secondly, there are there are solutions to the problem. I mean, I just gave you one that there are inconsistent sets of definitions and in certain circumstances, we have to use different definitions of identity, right? And so there you go. I mean, you might not like that solution, but it is a solution. And, uh, you know, I don't I don't know that that there's any sort of proof that that doesn't that's not a good answer to the problem okay uh fair enough and um so we're getting in now to the brain of the vat and uh, a lot of people you know might not realize uh Des well descartes probably first person to kind of bring this up um and then you've no, got not even <laughs> no i know what you're thinking you're thinking descartes the first one because he had this idea that the evil he, demon he, go, he goes if he's in the little whatever the log cabin or wherever he is and he's in and he's thinking well what if there's an evil deceiver that's yeah, like yeah. an evil demon that's making yeah. me think there's an external world but it's really not there but you can go back to plato's republic right and oh, oh uh, the cave the cave the cave Shadow. right oh okay so, yeah. the, so like you know, because there, there's like the fire behind them and, yeah, uh -huh. and the people that all they see are the shadows, right? And so so this is a problem that is as ancient as philosophy itself, right? Good point. Um, and, and so, yeah, so so the history is the, the allegory of the cave in Plato's Republic, Descartes' evil deceiver, um, Putnam's brain in a vat, and then the movie The Matrix, but there are lots of examples of this. Okay, so before we go into Chomsky's uh, response, tell us about the brain in the vat. Um, okay, so the the idea is is exactly like Descartes' example, except it's like got us. It's got this science fiction vibe to it. So now we're assuming that you know maybe you think you're sitting here. We sit. We think we're sitting here having this conversation. You you think you're drinking something green? I don't even I don't even want to know what that is, green juice. Um, but in point of fact, our brains have been removed from our heads, and they're in vats. And an evil scientist, or maybe a good scientist, I don't know. Just like in the movie The Matrix, uh, the the evil scientist is sending impulses to our brain to make us think that we're having this conversation and drinking green juice and so forth. Hence. We ask now, are we a brain in the vat? And then there is this thought that some people have is, well, you could never know that you're not a brain in a vat. How would you know? Maybe you would know, you know, 
suppose, you know, in the movie, The Matrix, you've, Neo figures it out because there's this kind of time delay or he's got this sense that something's off. But, you know, if you had a really, really, really good evil scientist, maybe, maybe there wouldn't be that, the sense of deja vu and that sense, maybe they could defeat that sense of, of something's not quite right, you know? And so then the question is, how could you ever know that you're not a brain in a vat? And Putnam has an answer. Yeah, Putnam gives an answer. <laughs> I don't know if he has an answer. His answer is, well, look, you say, uh, when I say I'm not a brain in a vat, or I am a brain in a vat, um, then I'm not really speaking English. I'm speaking vatlish. That is, I am speaking the language of the people that live in a vat. And when I do that, when I say, when I say, when I say right V-A-T or I pronounce vat, right? I'm doing that in vatlish, which is not English. And in vatlish, vat refers to a series of electronic impulses that the evil scientist sends to me. So that on Putnam's view, in a weird way, you can't even ask the question in a coherent way whether you're a brain in a vat, because you're really now you're just now you're now you're couching that thought in vatlish, uh, and you know that, that that you're not a brain in the vat in that sense is the idea. And so people following along, maybe we can already start to see what Chomsky's problem with this argument is going to be. And it is Chomsky's problem is that Putnam assumes that words refer to things. Yeah, that's right. But you can, you know, again, but I'm going to say the same thing again, that, you know, Chomsky thinks that all of these skeptical problems only arise because we're talking about the external world or trying to talk about the external world. But if you go back and read idealists, I mean, um, like British idealists, for example, uh, um, or German idealists. I mean, they're full of paradoxes and puzzles that they had to deal with. Right. right? And, and to be clear. Yeah. And to be clear, an idealist is somebody who doesn't believe in an external world. So it external might be somebody world. who believes in the, the brain of the vat. Uh, so when an idealist talks about a brain in a vat, they're, <laughs> they're not... They they don't they don't get a free they don't get a free ticket that says oh you don't have to think about the brain and the vat problem I can guarantee you they think about all of these problems right. idealists wrote right. you know miles of stuff on right. on on the ship of Theseus these are ancient problems that even idealists had to deal with okay um, by the way I, I just thought of something I just pulled this up on my phone as an old email and I didn't even realize that I had asked Chomsky this I was just trying to pull up what somebody else had said um, I but I, I it turned out I asked Chomsky I said I, a physicist was talking about the brain in a vat scenario and he's his name is like Miko Kachu I, I can't remember the guy's name Japanese physicist with long hair uh, um, uh. he says there is a scientific refutation of the brain in a vat scenario. Now, whenever I hear a science person say that there's a, the answer to like a philosophical question or there's like a scientific, you know, I, I, I'm i usually very skeptical. Like this person's about to say something where they have no idea what the philosophical uh, right. conversation is. Okay. Um, right. So uh, this physicist said, weather cannot be simulated. This, now, already you've got probably begging the question. Uh, the smallest object that can simulate the weather is the weather. And if the smallest object that can simulate itself is itself, then you cannot simulate it. Even if you could simulate the weather, he says, the weather is vastly more complex a system than the human brain. And Chomsky's response is, I don't see what this has to do with the brain and the vat argument and don't know by what metric we determine that the weather is more or less complex than the brain. Here I, here I tend to agree with him. I mean, in the first place, even if you had a scientific revolu sorry, refutation of the brain and the vat problem, you know, what are you going to say about Descartes' evil demon? You know, give me a scientific refutation of that. 
And uh, on the brain and the VAT thing, I mean, you don't need a perfect simulation, right? It just needs to be a simulation of the weather that's good enough, you know? So do his views on reference lead to the conclusion that there is no self? I know when I talked to McGinn last time, McGinn said Chomsky and arguably Hume doesn't believe there's a self. And so is this what you think where that comes from? Is Chomsky's going, well, there's no books, there's no banks, there's no tables because words don't refer to things. And so there's no self. I, I'd be interested in knowing where Chomsky says this. It's, it's certainly true that Hume thought that, right? So here's, let, let's talk about Hume for a second. Hume was an empiricist, which means that he thought that all of our knowledge has to come to us through our senses, everything, right? So there are no innate ideas or concepts at all. Everything has to come to you through the sense impressions. So here's some sense data of a patch of red or pink or whatever, like that dwarf behind me. You get this patch of pink or this patch of blue that's corresponding to my hoodie. Um, and then you, well, basically you have to construct knowledge from that. And uh, there's certain things that you don't get direct sense impressions of, like causality, for example. You don't, you don't perceive X causing Y, you see X happening, then you see Y happening. Um, likewise, Hume thought that you don't perceive the self the thing that is itself doing the perceiving, okay? I mean, this is an idea that a lot of philosophers have had. So Sartre held this too, that there is no I. So for example, when, when Descartes said, I think, therefore I am, people have argued like Sartre, and I suppose Hume would say this too. The problem there is you're presupposing the I. Who is this I, right? Nietzsche did that too, yes. Yeah, I think, so I think it's it's sort of this notion of the Cartesian ego or whatever. It's come under pressure from lots of quarters. Um, you know, whether Chomsky uh, is on board with that, I don't know. But someone like a popular writer like Dan Dennett seems to believe something like this as well. So, um, you know, there are these people that think there is no Cartesian ego. So when they say there is no self, I mean, that's what they mean. Some sort of little homunculus in there, the, the ego that is unifying this experience for us. Um, why does Chomsky think the primary purpose of language is for thinking and not communicating? As, as I've understood what he's talking about, he, he never really says it definitely is the primary function of language. Um, but he's saying it's like, well, this looks like the most probable explanation or something like that, or the most probable use of language. But the key thing and the important thing is the idea that, you know, it's, it's not really for communication, right? So the idea is that the language faculty, which is what he's talking about here, did not evolve for purposes of communication. But what you have here is what in evolutionary biology you would talk, call acceptation, which is to say that there is something that evolved for one purpose that gets taken up and used for some other purpose like the opposable thumb. I mean, that didn't necessarily evolve to allow us to use pencils and things like that. Um, and so the thought is that um, just as there are features of our anatomy that have been taken up and used for new purposes that are different than the original expl explanation of their evolutionary history, uh, so too, the language faculty is this thing that evolved for whatever reason, you know, um, and it has been taken up and is used by people for communication. But perhaps the reason that it evolved or had uptake was that it was a tool 
for thinking. Okay. So let, let me let me get a little bit more sharp about what his view here is. Um, so the idea is not that you think in natural language, right? So it's not like I'm thinking in English. So what he believes is that language are tools for building thoughts, right? So that what is what is what what is language? Well, it's not really this medium of communication. It is this little toolkit you have that you use for building thoughts. And oh yeah, we can also use it for communication, but that's not that's not why we have it, and that's not necessarily the most valuable function of the language faculty. I, I've heard him be skeptical about language being an evolutionary ad adaptation. Yeah, I think he, he, so. If you're familiar with uh, the evolutionary biologist Stephen D Stephen Jay Gould, oh yeah, um, that died some years ago, yeah. he wrote lots of popular as the panda's thumb and the spandrels of of. Uh, he's he's uh, great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically, Chomsky's view is pretty close to Stephen Jay Gould's on this, which is that he believes in not gradualism, punctuated equilibrium. Exactly, he believes in punctuated equilibrium. So the language faculty is an example of where we got punctuated equilibrium. And the other thing is just as the panda's thumb is something that the panda has, I forget how this goes, but isn't it something like, well, if you get a big toe or something like that, you get a thumb for free. So it's not like the thumb evolves, but like you get the big toe and then sort of that has this cascading effect in your anatomy. And so the thought is that there are these features of the human cognition, which did not evolve for the purpose of communication. They may have evolved for some other purposes. And now we use them for communication. Um, you know, so the panda uses its thumb to like strip bamboo plants of leaves or whatever. Um, but that's not how it evolved, right? That's not a story of the evolutionary history of the panda's thumb. So too, human beings use language to communicate with each other, but that's not, you know, that's not why it's here. And, and uh, clarify what you mean that it could have come about through punctuated equilibrium as opposed to... Yeah, so, so one view of evolution is things... To, so, so there's like, t for popular readers... Um, so there's like Steven Pinker on the one hand versus Stephen Jay Gould on the other. And Pinker thinks that our evolutionary development is, is sort of very gradual, like little tinkering at the edges and slowly, slowly, slowly we evolve. Uh, Stephen Jay Gould argued that, well, no, it's not really quite like that. You get this kind of uh, mutation and then that has a kind of very significant effect. So gradual, gradual, gradual. And then there's this sort of big kind of sort of quantum, I wanna say quantum leap or quantum change, but like a significant change um, uh, in, in the uh, anatomy of the creature. Um, now, you know, we're talking about scales of evolutionary history, you know, so we're talking about hundreds of thousands of years. We're not talking about days or minutes or something like that. But the idea is that you, you get these breaks in the evolutionary history that are triggered by certain kinds of mutations that have cascading effects. Chomsky says there's not a problem of consciousness. Um, he says, we know as much about consciousness as we do anything. It's our most obvious experience. The question, according to him, is what is matter? When we speak of consciousness, it's consciousness of matter or the material world and we don't know what matter is. So the real question isn't what is consciousness, it's what is matter. Uh, Chomsky's been saying this for a long time. If you go back and read his Nicaragua lectures, for example, he talks about it in there. Um, and his view is that uh, the mind-body problem is in some sense incoherent or it's not well formed. Um, and his view is that, you know, if you go back to the time of Descartes, it was very clear what was going on. So you had this kind of idea of mental stuff and you had a very concise understanding of what the physical world 
consisted in. Because you had this little billiard ball model of physical reality in Descartes, in Descartes' physics. So it was really like literally like billiard balls at the at the low level. And everything was running on so-called contact mechanics. This billiard ball hits this, boom, goes. All right. So um Chomsky then points out that, well, okay, but you know, that view, no one in physics has actually held that view since Descartes, right? Because Newton came along and then all of a sudden we're talking about action at a distance and pretty soon we're into taught people exploring atoms and things and finding that these subatomic particles and then we're doing like quantum physics and now we're talking about probabilities and and quantum matrices and we don't even know what physical you know when people talk about physical reality we don't know what even know what they're talking about anymore so what's going on and the idea is that well okay so on chomsky's view the only thing we really are clear on is the sort of mental side of it and the physical side is the part that's the mystery so normally, right, when you read like a, a scientist writing or anyone writing about the mind-body problem, they'll be like, well, we understand what matter is, but well, what's the mind? And then Chomsky turns that upside down. He flips that script and he says, no, no, I know what the mind is. I don't know what matter is and neither does science. And if you think scientists know what matter is, let me tell you, they haven't, they haven't had a coherent story about what matter is for like Whoa, 400 years or so. Yeah, I think McGinn included that as a mystery. Yeah, uh, that's one of McGinn's mysteries, yeah. Um, I think... Well, McGinn's mystery is about consciousness. I mean, isn't McGinn's mystery that like, well, what is consciousness and how can you have consciousness from based on a physical matter or something yeah. like that. Yeah. So, I mean, in a way, Chomsky's answer is no, 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 no. that's not the mystery. Right. Alan. You got it upside down. <laughs> the part that's coherent is the, the mental part and the consciousness part. That's the part we know about. And the part that's mysterious is the matter part. Now, let me tell you something here. Somewhere in the notes that you sent to me, somewhere there's a quote where Chomsky says he's a naive realist. Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. That's he the says most, he says that all the time. Yeah, but that's the most full of shit thing he's ever said in his life. Because if you just listen to what he's saying here, right? He's saying, "Oh, I don't know what the physical world is. I don't know what we mean by that. I know I only know what consciousness is. I know that you know the ship of Theseus is is a, is only a problem because we we think words refer to things in the physical world." If he doesn't sound like an idealist from like top to bottom in that discussion, I mean, I mean, you know, it's like it's like a textbook in in idealist philosophy. So, you know, I know he's never going to admit it. I mean, obviously, he's calling himself a naive realist. But like everything we've been saying in this in this interview, it's sort of like the opposite of okay. what a naive re realist says hold right? on, hold on. We have to unpack this. This is this. I didn't think we were going to go over here, but that's okay. So wait, are you saying that Chomsky might be an idealist? And first, let's be clear about what an idealist means. So that he would yeah. believe that there is no external world. Everything is in my head. Everything is mental. He has a more subtle view of it. It's not like I have... There's a clear conception of the mental and there's a clear conception of the physical. And I think only the mental exists. He has this notion that I understand what the mental life is about. I don't even know what you're talking about when you're talking about the physical, in the philosopher's sense of physical or material world. Uh, that is basically incoherent. I don't know what you're talking about. Want to talk about my conscious life? I'll talk about that. You want to talk about uh, linguistic reality? I'll talk about that. You want to talk about uh, my language faculty? I'll talk about that. Uh, if you want to talk about how my mind is structured and organized, I'll give you a theory of that. But when you start talking about the external physical world, I think what you're saying is just incoherent so it's not necessarily that he's saying 
the physical world doesn't exist. It's it's more of a like a skeptical position. Like I don't even know what you're talking about. So it's different from skepticism, right? In that a skeptic says, "Well, I know what you mean, but I don't. I I'm not going to sign on to that." Uh -huh. But it's more like he's saying, "I don't even know what you mean." Yeah, okay. Now, is this coming from? Uh, so when you're saying this, I'm thinking of people like Kant and Hume, who talk oh. about who talk about like what we experience is the mind is is putting on two things is uh, this kind well, of that's Kant, that's Kant's view yeah so you're projecting the mind is organizing the external world right so you have these categories of the understanding and it's right. it's imposing this structure on the yeah, in other world. words there's no like clear separation like what you're seeing it like your mind is making you see things a certain way is this Correct. is this kind of is this kind of the line he's on? I mean, or it sounds well, I think he's closer to yeah. I, that's what I think. I mean, he's closer to Hume than he is to Kant because Kant still has the thing in itself. Yes, that yes. he wants to talk about. Yes, I don't know that Chomsky has a thing in itself, so he's much closer to Hume. But now here, but here's the weird thing: like you and I, we you agree that Hume is an idealist. I mean, uh, I, I don't know. I don't know enough about Hume. I, I'm not disputing you. I don't know enough. Well, like if you buy a book called The British Idealists, I promise you that like a third of the book or more is going to be about Hume, right? And he's an idealist in the sense that he's sort of rejecting the, the physical world, right? He's rejecting the I, the, the Cartesian ego. Right, and you just have these sense impressions. Okay, so he's an idealist in that sense. But weirdly, if you go back and read that interview I did with Chomsky, you cited it earlier, he'll say, "Well, Hume's not an idealist." I remember that. Yeah. So what is going on there? I mean, it's sort of like it's you know the question is, well, what you know, what then do you think an idealist is? Because everyone thinks, even Hume thought that, you know, like, you know, when he left his study and came downstairs to play cards or to, to eat steak and kidney pie or whatever, I mean, he even he said that all this sort of skeptical stuff went away, right? If all Chomsky is saying is that, you know, like, I'm, I'm not an idealist in that, you know, when I walk around, I think I don't, I don't entertain skeptical hypotheses or I don't think that um there you know i'm not rejecting the idea of a mind external world i mean hume didn't think that no i don't know if any idealist thought that you know when you said to chomsky that you, you know wasn't human idealist chomsky said uh chomsky responded hume thinks no. this table is right here he thinks there's a coffee cup right here on the table that's what he's saying yeah but but that's not how you tell what an idealist is, right? So if you, the, the sort of famous example with a philosopher, Dr. Johnson says he's gonna refute Berkeley, Berkeley, another British idealist. And then he kicks a rock or something. And he says, I refute Berkeley thus by kicking a rock. Well, or what about, or what about the one, <laughs> what about the one where, where, where people go, all I have to do is hold up a mirror to my face. If I hold up a yeah. mirror, I can see me, so. Yeah, I'm not a brain right. in a vet. Uh, yeah, that's not because, you know, for thousands of years, idealists have looked at mirrors or at least since the invention of mirrors and they've been kicking rocks for thousands of years. And they, you know, they are aware that you can do these things, right? They're not so stupid. I don't know. I don't, I don't know what, what, what okay, so, Chomsky is going on about here when he so says real, he's not an idealist. So real quick then, sketch out what does, I, if idealism were true, what does it look like? So if there's no external world, then where does your mind exist? Like, paint a picture of how it would work. What would it look well, like? Well, um, I mean, look, there are gazillions of idealists that you can go back and read, and they all have different answers about, you know, where and why or or when or some of them like Ramsey and McTaggart. McTaggart, for example, had these arguments against the reality of time, right? So they have all these uh, different arguments about, you know, the construction of ideal reality or whatever the case might be. 
But surely Chomsky is going to say something like this, that my mental life is very obvious to me. It's very present. Uh, what is unclear to me is this notion of external physical world and concepts of matter and material substance and so forth. So stop telling me to try and give an account of my theory in terms of substance and external material world when those notions are ill-defined, incoherent, I don't know what you're talking about, right? What we should do is couch all of this in terms of things that we understand, which is in terms of uh, features of our, our, the construction and organization of our mental lives. And when Chomsky says that he's a naive realist, just quickly say, what does that mean? I mean, normally a naive realist is someone who thinks that the stuff is real is the stuff that you think is there. So that if you kick a rock, you think, oh yeah, it's a rock. Or if you uh, drink water, you think, oh yeah, I'm drinking water. But I, um, you know, but everyone, everyone, as far as I know, I mean, there might be idealists walking around that think are entertaining thoughts that they're not walking around in some sort of physical reality and it's all an illusion to them. But most idealists, um, you know, if you have dinner with them and you say, please pass the, the corn or something like that, they're gonna pass you the corn, right? Because they're not, uh, um, they know what you're talking about. Right to be, but they're gonna—they're just gonna reject your philosophical position that this means that there must be some sort of material substance underlying that corn. To be clear, Chomsky does follow up that by saying, "I am a naive realist, and like everybody, I can't help but be a naive realist." Yeah, in that sense. So, like Hume has a passage about this, right, where he sort of like leaves his study and comes down to play cards or whatever, and and then he sort of like leaves that philosophical position behind, right? So, what a lot of a lot of idealists are going to say is, in response to say Dr. Johnson when he kicks the rock, they're going to say, "Well, yeah, of course." Um, the thing is, when you say, I am kicking a rock, we have to translate that into the language of idealism, right? So no one denies that, you're, that kick, I kick a rock is true. The question is, what makes it true? Is it made true because there's some physical stuff that you're kicking? Or is it made true or made true because there's material substance that you're coming into contact with? Or is it made true because of certain um, mental structures that you're representing, right? Or some I sense impressions that you have in Hume's terms or Barclay's terms, right? Or is it made true because of certain kinds of ideal, idealized entities or objects or something like that? So everyone is going to say, yeah, 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 of course it's true that I'm kicking a rock, or of course it's true that I'm eating corn or asking you to pass the corn. But the question is, what do we translate that into? Is it the language of idealism or is it in the language of material stuff? And to me, it sounds like what Chomsky is going to do is translate that into uh, the, 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 the language of the mind. Right, the, the 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 language of mental representations. He's got to because you know words don't refer to things. Things don't refer to things in the external worlds. Mental representations have the contents they do completely independently of the external world, or the external world being in, in re, uh, re, or those representations referring to things in the external world. So I don't know on what understanding of idealism, Chomsky is not an idealist, right? But, you know, there he is saying Hume's not an idealist, and I, I don't follow that either. Is there a theme with it being hard to pin Chomsky down on some things? Yeah, it's very hard to pin him down on things because he, if you, pres this goes back to your very first question, when you asked me about meeting with Chomsky, if 
you present a thesis to Chomsky, he'll say, no, that can't be right. And uh, this applies even to you giving an account of his position, right? So you say, well, Chomsky argues that P. Usually, this depends on his mood, often, maybe usually, they'll say, well, no, that's not exactly right. Now, I think that's a good thing because I think it means, to me, it means that a lot of understanding something involves back and forth. Like you, like this conversation here, like, you know, I say whatever, idealism, and then we have this back and forth, you know, what do you mean by idealism? What do you mean by material stuff? And I believe that even when I, even if I write something myself, there, the, the meaning of what I said is open textured and it needs to be interrogated even by myself. So if I go back and read something that I wrote five years ago, I go, what did I mean by that? And I think it's good that uh, I interrogate what I said. And I think that when people present Chomsky's view and then he argues against it, um, that is his kind of way of interrogating his own work and the things that he said. And I think that's a good thing. I mean, some people think he's been, you know, a lot of people don't like Chomsky very much. And one of the things, part of that is because, you know, he's not going, yay, yay, super job and all that stuff. He's being critical, right? And he'll even be critical when you try and pin him down to what his position actually is. But this is how we make progress. This is how we deepen our understanding of what we're talking about. And it's, I think, I think, I don't know, but I think it's a way of him sort of deepening his understanding of what he himself is saying. Because there is no crystalline version of what we say or said, but we have to keep continually digging deeper and deeper into what we're saying. I, I think you're making an excellent point. I mean, when you look at it that way, I hope that that what you're saying is true because I think that's that would be a really admirable um, trait. You know, we're all learning and we're all kind of going through this and figuring things out. And some people might be surprised if what you're saying is true because they'd go, God, th there's nobody more certain that I've ever seen in philosophy than Noam Chomsky. I mean, he, he you know, the, he, or if you watch him in a political interview, he talks everything he says is fact and you don't disagree. If you disagree, you are just wrong. And you rarely see him say, you know, I thought something differently like a year ago. I, I think I was wrong. He just no, doesn't. <laughs> That's not how it works. Talk. That's not how it works. Yeah. But it's not, he's not out there just being dogmatic, right? How do we know? Because his position, his theory has changed so much over the years, right? So people talk about the Chomsky and revolution in linguistics, but you know, every five years, the theory goes through a kind of internal revolution, you know, it's pretty radical, quite radical, really. And so, um, you know, he'll, He'll push back on that, but he pushes back on everything. And I think, I really do believe this is his way of purchasing deeper insight into things. So if you talk to some of his stu his PhD students, right, they'll say, um, you know, he would just dispute everything. You go in there, you go, no, 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 that won't work. Think of this, think of this, until it's time to write up the dissertation. And they'll go, yeah, it looks good. Let's write it up, you know? Uh -huh. So it's like that continues up to the point when it's, all right, then it's time to write it up. Um, and, uh, and so you have to have this attitude, which is that you, you, you can't tie your identity to the ideas that you have because then you're going to take his criticism personally. And so, you know, throughout linguistics and, you know, throughout philosophy too, there are a lot of people that really do not like Chomsky. And they, a lot of that problem comes from the fact that they take his criticism to be personal. But he's not, as far as I can tell, he doesn't take that criticism personally at all. 
So for him, there are these ideas out there. Mm -hmm. um, they're not to be identified with you. Those are just some ideas right. that we're going to kick around and we're going to try and get some deeper insight into those ideas by investigating them critically. And we're in, investigating them critically. Not, I'm not doing it to dunk on you. I'm, I'm doing it so that we can get to understand these ideas better. And, and uh, not necessarily perfectly, because there's no such thing as perfect understanding, but to understand them at a deeper level. Uh, Peter, what um, share with people what your current interests are and what you want to share with them, any links or you know how they can find you? Um, I have a, a website, which is a Google Sites site, you know, um, so you can find that just by Googling my name uh, that has a whole bunch of my writing, the philosophical writing and the stuff that I did some years ago on hacktivism. Uh, there's some stuff I, I wrote on popular culture and th I have things on fan fiction. I have things on, on, you know, essays that I wrote on things like the video game Halo and all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, right now I'm working on a project which has to do with blockchain technology applied to new forms of governance. Thanks so much, Peter. Yeah, thank you. It was a good time. Um, hope to see you again. Hope to talk again sometime. Uh, I'm sure there'll be more things for us to talk about in the future.